Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Leah Baluch. We're going to be talking about an introduction to infectious diseases. For those of you that have already heard this or parts of this, I apologize, but I did add in some more slides compared to last time. So, without further ado, so goals for today just to get an introduction to immunosuppression because repetition is the key to remembering when I ask you on the wards. Uh, solid organ transplant, just a couple general items like which organs are involved, the timing of infectious complications as a brief overview. Then we move on to stem cell transplant, the timing of recovery of cells because that dictates your infectious disease type of risk. And then we go over a few specific viruses that we see in transplant ID. So immunosuppression in general, the theory is that we have it via three mechanisms. We deplete lymphocytes, we divert lymphocyte traffic, we block lymphocyte response pathways. Our drugs have therapeutic effects such as suppressing rejection, undesired effects of being immunosuppressed like you have increased risk for infection and cancer, that would be highly undesired. And then non-immune toxicity to other tissues like calcineurin inhibitors and nephrotoxicity. So, Sapna, can you give me two calcineurin inhibitors? So, yes, tacrolimus and cyclosporin. So, that segues here to our graphic. So, just talk about the three signals that are between antigen-presenting cells and our T cell. And, uh, by the way, I have these printed out so you don't have to take notes. So we have signal one, two, and three, and then going to the next picture, it talks about where our drugs work. So for example, looking right below signal one, we have cyclosporin and tacrolimus working at the calcineurin uh, pathway, hence the calcineurin inhibitor. Then we have more towards the upper right, you see the phrase cyrolimus and everolimus that then affect the M tor pathway, um, therefore halting signal 3. Then we have also azathioprine that we have used, and then on the far right, MPA, which is um, with the MMF family, how our other drugs work. And then here, just in words, calcium inhibitors, we have our tacrolimus cyclo cyclosporin with our adverse effects being acute or chronic kidney failure, mTOR inhibitors being our cyrolimus and everolimus, especially used in that's orthotopic liver transplants with hepatitis C. Our main issue is poor wound healing. So, um, Pamela, what do you think we do if we have then a hepatitis C patient who got a liver transplant and ideally want to use cyrolimus? In theory, what could we say do as our procedure? What would you think we do as a protocol? Let me give you option A, option B, okay? Because that's very vague. Uh, option A is you use the drug right away coming out of the OR. Option B, you say wait until your incision is preliminarily healed. <laughs> so yes, I stacked that in your favor. So B, you wait until you preliminarily heal so that you don't have dehiscence. But of course, you have to monitor the actual incision quite carefully. Then you have your purine biosynthesis inhibitors like mycophenolate mofetil. Adverse effect in solid organ transplant is diarrhea, but as you can note there, in BMT we have the delayed mucositis issue. With anti-metabolite, we use azathioprine. Steroids, we have topical versus the budesonide. And um, Jen, budesonide, uh, how does it look? I mean, what's special about budesonide? It is PO, but it's liquid, as Fong is mouthing to me. Uh, so oftentimes if you walk into the patient's room, there's a syringe. I get them thinking, wow, everyone's on posaconazole. No, it's <laughs> all the patients have oral GVHD, and as their budesonide, it's a very thick, oily type substance, and they use that for nausea, vomiting, or a little bit of oral pharyngeal or GI type of um, GVHD. Uh, B cell depleting antibodies, we use our anti CD20 for rituxan. Then, with our uh, triazoles, we have voriconazole, posiconazole, 
worry each time you give it to a patient you have to discuss with them potential problems with hallucinations uh, and then the issue being with IV voriconazole being uh, potentially more nephrotoxic um, in someone who already has renal insufficiency. And then, uh, Maria, in theory, do you know if you add, for example, voriconazole to a patient that is on tacrolimus, do you have to decrease or increase the tacrolimus dose? No? How about anyone else in the room? So as Sapna said, that you can hold the tac the day of the administration of the voriconazole and then uh, decrease the tacrolimus dose by approximately 50% and of course follow levels. T-cell depleting agents we often use as well like ATG or alemtuzumab. From a BMT perspective, we do it to reduce GBHD or graft rejection. From an ID perspective, it delays immune recovery and that specifically at Moffitt, we often see it for double cords or mismatch, whether it's mismatch unrelated or mismatch related. So we talk about the net state of immunosuppression. So you need immunosuppression in order to maintain the graph using your steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, nucleotide synthesis inhibitors versus your infectious risk on the other side of the scale bacterial, fungal, viral comes in many flavors, CMV, EBV, HSV, VZV, and of course mycobacterium reactivation and then the cancer risk is also something you have to look at. So solid organ transplant. Vivian, give me some organs. Organs. Organs, just give me some organs that we can transplant. Uh, we can transplant liver, kidney, pancreas. Mm -hmm. Funk, anything else? Yeah, there's a lot of things, and then now there's also the face transplants that are done, different body parts. So, uh, yes, heart, lung, you can have one lung or two lungs, depending on your etiology. Uh, Nancy, who do you think would require two lungs instead of just, or like two halves of a lung? No, that came out wrong. <laughs> Bilateral lung transplant over a unilateral lung transplant. Who do you think would require that? So cystic fibrosis, definitely. Why? Why do you think that is? Pathophys, why? Why bilateral? Why bilateral? Yeah, but you only, you don't need, you don't need the volume of two lungs, okay? Okay, so that's a bigger issue. The colonization, the bug, think of their lungs as being full of pus, that when you go in the OR and you take out one side, then all the pus will from the bad side will go into the new lung, and then you just ruined half a lung or one side of a lung. Um, whereas, and then the problem is, even if you give them a bilateral lung transplant, they also have the same organism traditionally also in their sinus and posterior pharynx. So that's why we give them so many antibiotics afterwards to try and decrease that risk of transmission of colonization from the upper respiratory down into the lower respiratory. For people who have like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, because it's not infectious etiology, it's just damage to the lung, they can often get away with a unilateral lung transplant also depends on how your center works and what kind of um, styles that their surgeons and their transplant pulmonologists like. So then with kidney, it comes also in a couple different styles. Uh, you can take a pediatric set of kidneys on block and give it to an adult in order to get sufficient uh, GFR. There's also living related uh, donor or just living related kidney transplant such that we know that if you have pristine kidneys you technically only need one and then you can give away the other one. 
whether it is to someone that you know or there are altruistic uh, people who give it to uh, a general donation allows for these domino transplants for example I give up a kidney to someone that's in Ohio because that's where the best match is and then whoever promised for the Ohio person gives to someone else and then you keep on making a staggered pathway like that because of you know HLA matching and antibodies that it often works out much better than just saying well I ma I kind of matched with my brother so I'll give it to him even though maybe my neighbor down the street has a better match so then there are deceased donor kidney transplants in terms of small bowel um, you know a lot of times it, this is a pediatric issue maybe they had necrotizing uh, bowel issues so then they get small bowel plus multiple organs liver and pancreas with the liver you can get whole liver or split liver which I'll go into details on the next slide and then as we mentioned various other body parts so split liver um, I actually when I first saw this up in Edmonton I asked the surgeon there I was like I've never seen this in Tampa we do liver transplants he's like you said Tampa Florida right and I'm like yeah he's like well your OPO your organ procurement company is very aggressive and our wait list is relatively short comparatively so they get the organs and you don't die as high of a rate on the list as other places whereas in Edmonton we have trouble getting a sufficient number of donations so this is a way to try and increase our number of recipients so that people don't die on the waiting list so there's a lack of a donor pool from one donor you can treat two recipients maybe the size is too large so you're going from an adult donor to a pediatric recipient and that uh, for peds they can often use the left lateral segments or the left and the left lobe um, the right lobe which is segments four to eight is rarely used in peds patients because it doesn't offer notable size advantage over the whole liver so then there's this phenomenon of living donors so you have a living person who gives some away for lack of a better word and keeps enough that they can survive themselves so we found that in uh, 1990 had the first successful living related liver transplantation where the left lateral segment went away from the mother to her child her child survived she survived from the procedure obviously you from the surgeon's perspective there's risk to the donor and you know you really want to make sure it's safe for the donor to continue to live his or her life for the rest of their life with part of a liver later on they did show reported outcomes in 20 children who got the left lateral segments from adult living donors and the patient survival was uh, 85 percent so pretty decent this is just because I like pictures talk about where in theory the smaller portion is given off to the child and then the larger portion is if you're having a deceased donor and then the larger portion can go to the adult so obviously you have to have uh, very good surgeons who are able to do this type of surgery as well and the main thing is again you're just trying to decrease the wait time on the list therefore decreasing the mortality of just waiting for your transplant so looking at the timeline for solid organ transplant, so you'll see is when we segue into stem cell transplant that the same organisms come up, it's just the timing is different. So because I'm rather nearsighted, I'm getting closer. Um, you have your nosocomial infections and your technical issues from the time of transplant for less than one month okay so your MRSA, VRE, candida species issues things that happen from the donor for example did the donor have HSV, did the donor have LCMV from maybe they had a pet hamster or you know rabies, West Nile virus things that in the ordinary donor screening that you missed and then you transmit to the recipient because they're on a lot of immunosuppression then when you get out to one to six months you're now traditionally discharged from the hospital so um, if you are not in prophylaxis you can get PJP you can have BK, C. diff, hepatitis C if you had it from before, adenovirus, a numerous number of things and then of course the list is broken up if you don't have appropriate prophylaxis what other things you can get and then more than six months now your immunosuppression is 
decreasing, you're more at risk for your regular community-acquired infections versus your late viral infections. So, holiday, what prophylaxis do we use uh, traditionally for PJP, PCP? Bactrim. And what is that prophylax also against? Toxo. Toxo. And incidentally, as we see in our HIV patients, what other bug has some, uh, is kind of suppressed when you're on Bactrim? That would, in theory, if you had disseminated diseases, you could also not only get it in your blood, but maybe, say, lesions in your brain, modified acid fast, no cardia, okay? So then, in, let me give you a theoretical question. If I don't tolerate, and it's more important, stem cell transplant, this question now goes to SUPNA. So if I'm a stem cell transplant patient and I'm only PJP positive and not toxo positive, then what else could I get if I can't get SEPTRA because of allergy or because I'm already pancytopenic? But if you're toxo negative, in theory, usually practically they just go to inhaled pentamidine because you just need the PJP prophylaxis. It's simple, it's easy, it's documented when they come in for clinic once every how many days, Pamela? 28 days. 28 days. Okay. So then, Jen, in theory, if I am both. P I need PJP prophylaxis, and I am toxopositive, and I can't get SEPTRA, then what's my option? A tovacone, correct. Okay, so moving on to stem cell transplant. This is just because, again, graphics are neat. Looking in theory, if someone needs a transplant, you look first at the family members, so looking for either a match-related donor, like a sibling or a mismatch, versus if there's ma no match in the family, you look at the national registry, so these become match-unrelated donor or mismatch-unrelated donor. Here in the U.S., we look locally in the United States, and then we start looking at the international type of registries, whether from Japan or certain countries in Europe. Then we compare that looking at the cord registry, understanding for adults we need two sets of cords, what we call a double cord transplant. But when you engraft, you actually only engraft with one cord. So when we do the uh, bone marrow biopsy for follow-up, after hopefully after engraftment, that you will see you know 100% of cord A or cord B. So type of stem cell transplant, allogenic, you know, is when you transplant hemopoietic cells from one individual to another uh, individual. Um, for Caucasians, uh, I would think most likely is because there are more Caucasians in the registry that, you know, you can get a match for approximately 70% of Caucasians. And uh, the way we get peripheral blood stem cell allografts is you give GCSF to the donor and then you're able to um, freeze out the cells and then we, for lack of a better word, clean them, adjust them at the stem cell laboratory and then we infuse them into the patient. We actually do take cultures when we're prepping the cells. Uh, those are our stem cell cultures as well as from each bag as it's infusing into the patient because we're making sure nothing's gotten contaminated or if there's a bacterial infection that we then treat it after they've received their graft. Traditionally, aloes are for AML and ALL and then you can see down the list. Um, we are using them here at Moffitt for young multiple myeloma patients trying to give them more of a permanent answer because you'll see traditionally aut autologous stem cell transplants are for multiple myeloma patients and lymphoma patients. The goal of the stem cell transplant, of course, is especially for aloes, is lifelong engraftment of the administered cells. Overall risk for our patients, well, early causes for mortality and morbidity, disease relapse, acute GVHD. Maria, what kind of symptoms would you get if you have acute GVHD of the gut? GI. Not usually pain, diarrhea. 
Diarrhea is a big problem. So, of course, the first thing they order is infectious workup, C. diff, and you're like, negative. And then they're like, rhoda, and you're like, no. And then they just go down the list. And then, unfortunately, they require biopsy, and this is a biopsy-proven type of diagnosis. Um, infection, of course, early on is uh, not ideal. Graft failure and regimen uh, toxicities. Long-term causes for morbidity and mortality, chronic GVHD, infection again, and then you can see growth, failure, cataracts, AVN. It all depends on how much steroids and for how long are you on high-dose steroids and other secondary malignancies that can uh, definitely occur. So neutrophil recovery really depends on your source of your stem cell transplant. In theory, uh, for example, we're talking about engraftment when your ANC is in more than 500. If you have a GCSF mobilized uh, stem cell transplant, we're looking at two weeks. A marrow graft is three weeks. Umbilical cord is definitely longer at four weeks. And with thiotipa, it can be even longer than that. First, you recover your neutrophils, and then you go on to your B and T cells, and then red blood cells and platelets. So we actually only hold them until the ANC is more than 500, and they don't have acute infectious issues, and they should be able to eat, unless they're early uh, discharges. So again, the same thing, just in graphic. As you can see with the most important line, which is the yellowish line, how you know it comes up first. All right. And then this is now talking about same idea, timeline for stem cell transplants, but whereas before it was in months, here we have it in days. You have day zero is the day of trans, uh, your actual stem cell transplant, and then up to day 15, 45, you have your infection. So, um, Vivian, prophylaxis that at Moffitt starts on day minus two for a stem cell transplant is what? What, what, and what? You got three drugs. Right? And? Yes. So it's ciprofloxacin against your mainly gram negatives and, um, you know, some of your mouth flora. Then the mycofungin, because candida starts way f before aspergillus does as a risk factor. And then the acyclovir because of HSV. So our prophylaxis is, being re is reflecting our issues, our potential infections. So, oh, and then uh, just talk about, you know, post-engraftment CMV becomes more of an issue, though technically we do check at our facility for CMV PCR even prior to the infusion of chemotherapy. Why? Because some patients walk into transplant already with active CMV replication. So, Fung, if someone comes to you and you're on the BMT wing and someone already has a CMV more than 1,000 and they're two days prior to transplant, the infusion of transplant, Transplant, what's going to be your drug of choice for CMV for that patient? Gangcyclovir? It's going to be foscarnate because actually this is a patient who's going to be infused, is going to be pancytopenic, most likely neutropenic, so you can't use gangcyclovir because of the bone marrow suppressive side effects, so foscarnate is your drug of choice at that juncture. And then late phase, again, going into your encapsulated bacteria. Now, you know, PJP, aspergillus, these all become issues, especially VZV. So this just goes into further details. Why, and let's see, phase one, what are your issues? You're having a break in your mucocutaneous barriers called mucositis, increased risk for translocation, and then HSV reactivation. So you know, f you use prophylaxis in our patient population if your neutropenia is expected to be more than seven days, which for these patients, they definitely are. We no longer use the empiric gram-positive coverage with vanc or daptomycin, and depending on your protocol, uh, some protocols will advocate the use of GCSF and GMCSF, but there's no change in mortality. Phase two, you know, you still have your impaired CMI, so CMV becomes an issue. All your other latent human herpes viruses are an issue. And, you know, you can consider antibiotic prophylaxis for encapsulated bacteria if you have ongoing issues with GVHD requiring high doses of immunosuppression. Late phase, 
you know, your highest risk if you have chronic GVHD because, again, immunosuppression. And if you've gotten, you know, like, for example, double cord. Here's just a, a different way of writing how you can become more at risk for infectious diseases. So, uh, again, autos have the less problems than allos. So if someone has higher risk, you know, and in theory they can go for either one, then you would consider an auto in them. If they're getting GVHD, they're higher risk. Why? Because they're on more steroids and immunosuppression. Bottom line, stem cell transplant actively it causes neutropenia and mucosal damage. It leads to infections. You have to risk stratify depending on how long their neutropenic defects are both in cell mediated immunity and humoral immunity. And unfortunately, at this time, there are no good surrogate markers for measuring these immunities from our perspective. The longer you are from transplant, the better you are off in terms of your immune system, especially if you don't have GVHD. And then you can actually get revaccinated and hopefully improve your immune system against some of the issues that we'll see next. In terms of screening prior to transplant, either solid or stem cell transplant, we look at donor issues, we look at a variety of viruses. If you have active CMV, EBV, or Toxo, you actually are not supposed to donate at that time. And for recipients, we look at the same things, and that helps dictate to us or risk stratifies them as well. Of course, if they have active syphilis, they need to be treated prior to coming to transplant. Strep pneumoniae, this is just talking about some of the organisms, annual incidence of invasive um, pneumonia infection in our aloes. If you have GVHD, it's obviously much higher, 8.23 versus 20.8. We recommend the vaccine. And you, you know, it is a three level data, but it, we recommend oral penicillin if you have chronic GVHD or low IgG. CMV drugs, um, you know, in general, you have these three drugs, gangcyclovir, foscarnis, sidofovir. If you're going to remember anything, gangcyclovir causes bone marrow suppression. Foscarnit and sidofovir cause renal impairment. Um, you know, if someone has not engrafted yet, you cannot use gangcyclovir, or you should not use Cydofovir, I mean uh, gangcyclovir. If you know that's when you use your foscarnit and cydofovir, and of course you know you have to, you know, try to decrease your pressure on the kidneys. If you need foscarnit, make sure you know they're not on other drugs that would say interfere with that. And then trying to do your prehydration. So CMV disease and immunocompromised hosts. I just the reason I put this in here is because even though all of these are immunocompromised hosts, they behave differently. So CMV can cause hepatitis type picture in both all of these, but much more so in solid organ transplant. GI symptoms in all patients. Uh, Joe, um, if you think someone has CMV in the GI tract, how do you prove that? Well, first of all, what would be their symptoms? And second of all, how would you prove it? GI tract. Yep. Be but that's a, that's a, yeah. give me the symptoms. What would the patient come to you in clinic or in the hospital and tell you? Doc, I have, mm, and doc, I have. Mm. Um, like okay. And what about CMV enteritis? Okay, diarrhea or ulcers, and then how do you prove it that it's CMV? Because imagine I'm a stem cell transplant patient, I come to you with diarrhea, so you make sure it's not infection, uh, like regular infection like C. diff, noro, rota, then what do you do? Right, so these people need scope. They need biopsy tissue is definitely the issue. And then they look for specific things. They are looking for GVHD markers. They are looking for CMV stains, HSV stains, because a lot of times they have the same symptoms. They look the same grossly on image when they take the picture. So you need the biopsy. All right, now, Sapna, 
in theory, if I had a patient who was a stem cell transplant, who wasn't grafted, who comes to you with CMV enteritis and diarrhea, meaning diarrhea, they get the biopsy, it's definitely CMV, what can you not give them for treatment? Or what would not be ideal to give them for treatment out of our drug types or the names that are up there? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, are they all IV? Right, so that would be my point, that you, this would be your one time that you wouldn't think, because otherwise, usually, you know, who can take gang cyclovir can take val gang cyclovir. But my point being, if someone has diarrhea and has high transit of their, you know, gut, they are not candidates for giving them oral, at least until you get it under control and they're not really having copious watery diarrhea because then they will definitely have pill fragments and then you're not absorbing the drug. And then it's, if they don't get better, it's not from failure of the drug, it's just they're not absorbing the drug and that doesn't count. So at least in the beginning, definitely consider giving them IV if they have GI symptoms. Uh, the retinitis is much more so in our AIDS population. Pneumonitis we see quite a bit in our stem cell transplant and lung transplant. Um, rejection is definitely associated uh, with both of the organ transplant versus BMT. And uh, CMV as a disease can be immunosuppressing in solid organ transplant. But I mean, we do see it in stem cell transplant. So when we're doing an infectious workup for new onset pancytopenia in a stem cell transplant, and we do a biopsy making sure it's not relapsed, we'll also send it for workup to make sure there's not CMV in the bone marrow. So uh, CMV can be intermittently shed in the oral pharynx and GU tract if you're CMV negative as a transplant recipient and you should already get leukoreduced blood, but ideally should be CMV negative if possible. If you are a CMV positive recipient or a CMV positive donor, you can be considered for either prophylaxis or preemptive treatment. Pamela, do you know what that means? All those P words? Prophylaxis versus preemptive. What are the two different theories? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And why would you do one over the other? What are the pros with prophylaxis or the cons or whichever? Also, the whole thing of you know, if you're always prophylaxing someone, compliance goes down. I'm sure it because the number of pill bur the pill burden goes up, and whether or not you're getting for you know, quote unquote, bang out of your buck, you know, as a patient or as a doctor. Whereas with preemptive, a lot of people and our facility included, for our stem cell transplant patients, we wait CMV uh, more than 1,000. Um, for certain patient populations and then those are the ones that we treat because we think those are the ones that are higher risk that having real disease and then you know you only have the side effect of the drug while we really need it for treatment. Um, so sometimes we consider uh, secondary uh, anti-CMB prophylaxis that's um, more of an issue in uh, certain types of high risk cases. Uh, Treatment options, like I mentioned before, gang cyclovir or val gang cyclovir not ideal prior to engraftment. But obviously, if you're looking at someone whose kidneys are quite tenuous, sometimes depending on how your BMT team works with the ID team, um, it might still end up being the better option. But traditionally, phosphocarnine and cydofovir are your drugs of choice for people pre-engraftment. And then of course you have to worry about cross-resistance with gangcyclovir and cydofovir. 
and with phosphocarbonate, you know, the electrolyte monitoring. We'll s the main thing with this slide on CMB resistance is the two main resistance uh, mutations that we talk about a lot are UL97 and UL54. UL97 uh, gives you your resistance to gang cyclovir. Uh, it's approximately 94% of your gang cyclovir resistance issues. And because this was made on a regular PC, that's why I'm like, why is nothing fitting? <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, UL54, it gives you your resistance for gang cyclovir and cytophavir more so than for phosphocarnate. And so you can send your samples if you're concerned for resistance, as mentioned at the top, your clinical suspicion. Either with appropriate treatment, your viral load doesn't decrease, or it initially goes down but then comes back up, and you have persistent viral load despite your two weeks of induction treatment. So, Jen, with, I don't know if you noticed, with induction treatment for gang cyclovir versus maintenance, what is the difference in dosing? No idea. Anybody? So with um you know, cyclovir induction is usually five units per kid per day. Mm -hmm. Um and then whenever you're doing maintenance dosing, it's two once a day. But you adjust the phase of position to be more moderate. Right. So um as Sapna said, uh, in theory, the same dose but by half is for maintenance versus induction. So, for example, if someone has pristine kidneys, uh, they get 5 mg per kg of gang cyclovir IV BID for induction for 2 weeks, followed by maintenance, which is 5 mg per kg once a day if they're requiring the IV. And then, uh, in general, you can also talk to the primary team about possibly decreasing immunosuppression because again it goes back to that whole idea of net state immunosuppression if you're giving a whole bunch of high dose steroids or immunosuppression in general it's going to be really hard to clear the CMV and this is just showing how towards the left you can see gang cyclovir and cytophavir resistance being very close together whereas phoscarna is out by its lonesome uh, late CMV disease risk factors and allos, again, chronic GVHD being reflected most likely by your steroid use, a low CAD4 count, a CMV negative donor to a CMV positive recipient, and the use of double cord unrelated or T-cell depleted allos. Just we'll say a few words about EBV. Uh, EBV reactivation uh, usually is discussed in the literature as where you have a positive viral load, but say less than 1,000, depending on your per hospital's um, uh, PCR. Viremia for us is more than 1,000, and then PTLD traditionally is discussed as having viremia with lymphadenopathy. Risk factors in our BMT patients are T cell depletion, umbilical cord transplants haploidentical transplants and just having more immunosuppression. So, um, Maria, do you know what's number one? If you have someone, let's talk about solid organ transplant where it's more clear. If someone has PTLD, you just get diagnosed with it, what's usually the first thing you try to do? Which means they have big lymph nodes everywhere. No? Yeah, to try and treat it, to try and decrease your PTLD. No? Anyone in the room? So number one is decrease immunosuppression. Try to let the patient's body resolve the lymphadenopathy, especially in peds that works very nicely. Uh, number two, uh, we would do a biopsy. And then Vivian, what kind of marker are we ideally trying to find on the lymphadenopathy in a solid organ transplant patient? Reflected by what we're going to use to treat it. So, I have a pediatric solid organ transplant patient staring at me on the table, has lymphadenopathy, has EBV viral load more than 1,000, took a biopsy. What do I need to tell the pathologist I am looking for something something so that I know if I can use my something something drug?
Anybody in the room? Jen, you look. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking for a CD20 marker so that I can then use what drug? Rituximab, okay? So, first decrease immunosuppression. Oftentimes we try MMF. Then we look for a CD20. We can give it Q weekly up to four doses. There's traditionally no antiviral treatment that will help. And then, unfortunately, if they have disseminated disease, you might have to consider get using CHOP R. So, if oh, and then the note at the bottom: understand that if your patient is still in the first part of their transplant for a stem cell transplant, and they haven't engrafted and they're neutropenic, obviously you really can't give them CHOP R if they're not engrafted. So then you run out of options rather fast. Uh, in terms of HSV, uh, we recommend acyclovir prophylaxis till engraftment and mucositis is resolved. Actually, at Moffitt, we make it very simple that you actually get it for one year. You might get it longer if you have active uh, GVHD that's being treated. The data supports that if you're VZV positive, meaning you've had chickenpox, that you get acyclovir products for one year. If you're HSV only, you actually need the acyclovir only for one month. But, you know, sometimes it's simpler just to say everybody gets it for minimum one year. It's rather well um, tolerated by our patient population. Uh, for VZV, as I mentioned before, you get uh, for one year for auto or for aloes, uh, especially at Moffitt. And if you have more immunosuppression, you can prolong it. Because the idea being if you have more immunosuppression, you can reactivate still. BK virus, uh, we have urinary shedding even in our immunocompetent blood donors. The idea being for stem cell that you have decreased cell media immunity versus BK virus, so you get replication in the urine. That's why you check the urine first. If it's high in the urine, then you check the blood. If it's not in the urine, don't be checking the blood. That's not the best use of your um, time or uh, funding for your patient. Urinary shedding can occur in 60 to 80 percent of your stem cell uh, transplant patients. And then there's BK associated hemorrhagic cystitis, 5 to 15 percent of our patient population. Um, make sure, though, of course, that you understand there are other things. If someone comes to you and says, Look, I'm a stem cell transplant patient and I'm peeing blood, in theory, what's your first line of workup, Fong? Yeah, check a UA, micro, urine culture. Oftentimes, they'll say too numerous to count. Okay, make sure there's not an infection. And then uh, then you look like, okay, well, if they're on the inpatient service, you can make sure they're not getting other chemotherapies, cyclophosphamide, busulfan, iphosphamide, total body irradiation. If you're looking for other infections, adenovirus and CMV can do this. I just had a disseminated adeno patient. He had conjunctivitis. He had some shortness of breath. The reason why he got flagged was he came in with gross blood when he was peeing. We checked his blood. It was positive in the blood. So then, Nancy, what drug did they put him on for disseminate adenovirus? We actually, so there's only case reports really for treating with ribavirin. He is on cytofavir. So we had a case uh, back in Edmonton, pediatrics multi-organ transplant, disseminate adeno. We actually gave him the CMX001, which is the oral lipophilic um, cytofavir, and it did very nicely. We had beautiful graphs of his viral load decreasing while on CMX001. Supposedly, it has less renal toxicity than the regular. Um, I think we should stop there. I have more. I think I accidentally, when I put in the more SOT stuff, it became too long. How much more do you have? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> we can cheat. We oh, only two more slides. We can do that, right? Yeah, sure. No. All right. So hepatitis B. Make sure you're noticing which one is donor, which one is recipient. So if your donor has active infection with hepatitis B DNA, all right. The donor before donating, and this is like, you know, the only donor you're gonna have, and there's no one else. Ideally, they should get the highest activity drug, which is your entecavir, for four weeks or till DNA is negative. So especially if this is like your sibling who has hepatitis B and is going to you. So at the time of donation, you check the donor DNA, which ideally should be negative. 
and you give it to the recipient. So I give it to my brother, and then you can follow on the recipient. Now, ideally, the recipient should receive a mifidine six months until past uh, immunosuppression has been stopped. Obviously, this is only one recipe. There is not a consensus as can be seen by some of the discussions at Moffitt about what to do. This is just one resource that recommended from this point of view. But the idea makes sense. You give the strongest you can to the donor to get it as pristine as possible before you give it to the recipient. And especially if the recipient is not immunized and not protected, then they're at risk for getting active infection. So Talk about that next case scenario. If the patient has core positive and a real core, not a, you know, just false positive core, but you really think that they had an infection and then they cleared it with the surface antibody being positive. So these people are at risk for reactivation is very low during chemo or conditioning regimen. The risk does increase as you give them more immunosuppression, more steroids for their GVHD. So you follow their um, ALT. If it starts to elevate, then you check for the DNA that shows replication. At that juncture, you can start treatment. And then you can, what you do is you're checking for your protection every three months. If you lose the protection, that's when you can start replicating. And then it's definitely no consensus that I can see that, you know, lamivudine versus entecavir for reactivation of your own hepatitis B. But note that lamivudine is an older drug. It's cheaper. We have more experience with it. And entecavir is more expensive, less experienced. But if you blow through entecavir, then you really don't, at this juncture, have a lot of options after that. Hepatitis C, if your donor is hep C RNA positive, there's definitely a risk for if you give it to your recipient post-transplant. The risk is less if the donor is RNA negative, and the theoretical risk is you just progress to cirrhosis faster post-transplant. And this is just my plug for it. Everybody should sign up for the bone marrow registry. Uh, back when I was a second year med student, one of my classmates got the bus to come to the med school and all of us got registered. Because the fact is, this is a great way to donate. You don't have to actually, in theory, you're, you're not dead in order to donate. So I mean, what other gift is there for these people? It potentially gives them their whole life back to them. So that's it. And thank you very much.